I'd like to read some observations of John Owen from Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and powerful, or effectual, and sharper, more cutting or cutting more, than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner, or a discerning judge, of the thoughts and intents or conceptions of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not apparently manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do, or to whom we must give an account. Observation. Though men may clothe and hide things from themselves and others, yet they cannot exclude the power of Christ and his word from piercing into them. Men are apt strangely to hide, darken, and confound things between their soul and their spirit, that is, their affections and their minds. Herein consists no small part of the deceitfulness of sin, that it confounds and hides things in the soul, that it is not able to make a right judgment of itself. So men labor to deceive themselves. Isaiah 28.15 So when a man can countenance himself from anything in his affections, his soul, against the reflections that are made upon him from the convictions of his mind or spirit, or when he can rest in the light of his understanding, notwithstanding the perverseness and forwardness of his affections, he is very apt to be secure in an ill condition. The first deceives the more ignorant, the latter deceives the more knowing Christian professors. The true state of their souls is by this means hid from themselves, but the power of Christ and his word will pierce into these things and separate between them. He does so as to his, number one, discerning, number two, discovering or convincing, and number three, his judging power. First, let things be never so close and hid, he discerns all clearly and distinctly. They are not hid from him. Psalm 139, verse 4, Jeremiah 23, verse 24. And where he designs to the conviction of men, he makes his word powerful to discover to them all the secret follies of their minds and affections, the hidden recesses that sin has in them, their close reserves and spreads them before their eyes to their own amazement, Psalm fifty twenty one. So our apostle tells us that by prophesying or expounding the word of Christ, the secrets of men's hearts are discovered. That is to themselves. They find the word dividing asunder between their souls and spirits, whereon they fall down and give glory to God, 1 Corinthians fourteen twenty four and 25. And by this also he exercises his judging power in men. Let men arm themselves never so strongly and closely with love of sin and pleasure, carnal security, pride and hatred of the ways of God, until their brows become as brass and their neck as a sinew of iron, or let their sins be covered with a fair pretense of a profession. Christ, by his word, will peer through all into their very hearts, and having discovered, divided, and scattered all their vain imaginations, he will judge them and determine of their state and condition. By this he breaks all their strength and peace, and the communication of supplies and sin and security that have been between the mind and the affections, and destroys all their hopes. Men are apt to please themselves in their spiritual condition, though built on very sandy foundations. And although all other considerations fail them, yet they will maintain a life of hopes, though ungrounded and unwarrantable. Isaiah 57.10 This is the condition of most false professors, but when the word of Christ by his power enters into their souls and consciences, it utterly casts down all their confidences and destroys their hopes and expectations. Nothing now remains but that such a person betake himself wholly to the life which he can make in sin, with its lusts and pleasures, or else come over sincerely to him in whom is life, and who gives life to all that come unto him. So he slays the wicked with the breath of his lips, Isaiah 11 verse 4. And this is a progress that the Lord Christ makes with the souls of men. First, he discerns himself their state and condition, what is good or evil in them. Secondly, he discovers this to themselves or convinces them of their sins and dangers, which surprises them with fears and sometimes with amazements. 
Thirdly, he judges them by his word and condemns them by it in their own consciences. This makes them give over their old security and confidences and betakes themselves to new hopes that yet things may be better with them. Fourthly, he destroys these hopes also and shows them how vain they are, and hereon they either betake themselves wholly to their sins, so to free themselves from their convictions and fears, or sincerely give up themselves to him for relief. To this purpose again it is added that this word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That is, one that so discerns them as to put a difference between them and a past judgment upon them. Observation 5. The Lord Christ discerns all inward and spiritual things in order to his future judgment of those things, and the persons in whom they are on their own account. Our discerning, our judging, are things distinct and separate, discerning everything weakly, imperfectly, and by parts or pieces. We cannot judge speedily if we intend at all to judge wisely. For we must judge after the sight of our eyes and reprove after the hearing of our ears. That is, according as we can take in by weak means an understanding of what we are to make a judgment upon. With the word or son of God it is not so, for he at once discerns all things perfectly and absolutely, in all their causes, circumstances, tendency, and ends, and the same instant he approves or condemns them. The end of his knowledge of them is comprised in his knowledge itself. Hence to know in the scripture, when ascribed to God, does sometimes signify to approve, accept, and justify, sometimes to refuse, reject, and condemn. Therefore Christ, judging of the thoughts and intents of men's hearts, is inseparable from his discerning of them, and the end why he fixes his eye upon them. For this cause is he said to be of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, so as not to judge after the sight of his eyes, nor approve after the hearing of his ears. That is according to the outward appearance and representation of things, or the profession that men make, which is seen and heard, but he judges with righteousness and reproves with equity according to the true nature of things, which lies hidden from the eyes of men. Isaiah 6, 3 and 4. He knows to judge, and he judges in and by his knowledge, and the most secret things are the special objects of his knowledge and judgment. Let not men please themselves in their secret reserves. There is not a thought in their hearts, though but transient, never arising to the consistency of a purpose, not a pleasing or seeming desirable imagination in their minds, but it lies continually under the eye of Christ, and at the same instant that very judgment is by him passed on them, which shall be given out concerning them at the last day. Oh, that we could always consider with what awe and reverence, with what care and diligence we ought continually to walk before this holy all-seeing one. And a description that is given of him when he came to deal with his churches, to judge them with righteousness and reprove them with equity, not according to the sight of his eyes or the hearing of his ears, that is the outward profession that they made. It is said that his eyes were as a flame of fire, Revelation one fourteen, answerable to that of Job to God, hast thou eyes of flesh, or seest thou as man seeth? Chapter ten four. He does not look on things through such weak and failing mediums as poor fell creatures do, but sees all things clearly and perfectly according as they are in themselves, by the light of his own eyes, which are as a flame of fire. And when he comes actually to deal with his churches, he prefaces it with this. I know thy works, which leads away, and his judgment on them upon the account of those works immediately follows after. Revelation 2 and 3. And it may be observed that the judgment that he made concerning them was not only wholly independent of their outward profession, and oftentimes quite contrary to it, but also that he judged otherwise of them, yea, contrary to that which in the secret of their hearts they judged of themselves. See chapter 3.17. So when Judas was in the height of his profession, he judged him a devil. John six seventy and 71. And when Peter was in the worst of his defection, he judged him a saint, as having prayed for him that his faith may not fail. So does he know that he may judge, and so doth he judge together with his knowledge, and this easily and perfectly, for all things are naked and open before him. So that, observation 6, it is no trouble or labor to the word of God to discern all creatures. 
and all that is of them and in them, seeing there is nothing but is evidently apparent, open, and naked under his all-seeing eye. It would be necessary here to open the nature of the knowledge or omniscience of God, but that I have done it at large in another treatise, whereunto I refer the reader. Now, after the consideration of all the particulars, we may subjoin an observation that naturally arises from the multiplying of the instances here given by the Apostle, and it is that observation 7, it is a great and difficult manner really and practically to convince professors of the practical judging omnisciency of Jesus Christ, the Word of God. On the account hereof, added to the great importance of the thing itself unto our faith and obedience, does the Apostle here so multiply his expressions and instances of it. It is not for nothing that what might have been expressed in one single plain assertion is here set out in so many, and with such variety of allusions suited to convey a practical sense of it to our minds and consciences. All professors are ready enough to close with Peter in the first part of his confession. Lord, you know all things, but when they come to the other, thou knowest that I love thee, that is, to make a practical consideration of it with respect to their own hearts and ways, as designing in all things to approve themselves unto him, as those who are continually under his eye in judgment, this they fail in and are hardly brought to. If their minds were fully possessed with the persuasion of it, were they continually under the power of it, it would certainly influence them to that care, diligence, and watchfulness which are evidently wanting in many and the most of them. But love of present things, the deceitfulness of sin, the power of temptations, cares, and businesses of life, vain and uncertain hopes do effectually divert their minds from a due consideration of it. And we find by experience how difficult it is to leave a lasting impression of it on the souls of men. Yet would nothing be of more use to them in the whole course of their walking before God. And this will further appear if after the precedent exposition of the several particular parts of these verses, and brief observations from them, we duly consider the general design of the Apostle and the words, and what we are instructed in by them. And the foregoing verses, having greatly cautioned the Hebrews against backsliding and declension in their profession, acquainted them with the nature and danger of unbelief, and the deceitfulness of sin in which that cursed effect is produced, the Apostle in these verses gives an account of the reason of his earnestness with them in this manner. For although they might pretend that in their profession they gave him no cause to suspect their stability or to be jealous of them, yet he lets them know that this is not absolutely satisfactory, seeing that not only others may be deceived in the profession of men and give them a name to live who are really dead, but they also may please themselves in an apprehension of their own stability when they are under manifold decays and declensions. The principles and causes of this evil are so close, subtle, and deceitful that none is able to discern them but the all-seeing eye of Jesus Christ. On the account whereof he minds them fully and largely of his power and omniscience, whereunto they ought to have a continual regard in their faith, obedience, and profession. Hence we are instructed first at the beginning or entrance into declension in profession or backsliding from Christ in the ways of the gospel are secret deep and hardly discoverable, being open and naked only to the all-discerning eye of Christ. Secondly, that the consideration of the omniscience of Christ, his all-searching and all-seeing eye, is an effectual means to preserve the souls of professors from destructive entrances and the backslidings from the gospel. Thirdly, the same consideration duly improved is a great relief and encouragement to those who are sincere and upright in their obedience. For the Apostle intends not merely to terrify those who are under the guilt of the evil cautioned against, but to encourage the meanest and weakest sincere believer who desires to commend his conscience to the Lord Jesus and his walking before him, and these things being comprehensive of the design of the Apostle in these weighty words of truth and wisdom, and being greatly our concernment duly to consider must be distinctly handled and spoken to. Observation 8. For the first of the propositions laid down, it is the design of the Apostle to teach it in all those cautions which he gives to these professing Hebrews against this evil, 
and concerning the subtleties and surprisals in which it is attended. Everywhere he requires more than ordinary watchfulness and diligence in this manner, and plainly intimates to them that such is the deceitfulness of sin, so various and powerful are the temptations that professors are to be exercised with, unless they are exceedingly heedful, there will be no preventing of a surprisal or seduction into some degrees at least of declension and backsliding from the gospel. There will be some loss or decay in faith or love or works one way or other. The Asian churches are a sad exemplification of this truth. In a short time, the most of them were greatly fallen off from their first gospel engagements, yea, so far as that some of them are threatened with excision and casting off from Christ. And yet no one of those churches seems to have had the least sense of their own decays. And those in special who had made the greatest progress and fallen away were yet justified by others with whom they conversed, having amongst them a name to live, and applauded themselves and their condition, is that which was good and in nothing blamable. In this state the Lord Christ comes to make a judgment concerning them, as all things lay open and naked under his eye. And a description that is given of him upon his entrance into this work, it is said, as was observed before, that his eyes were as a flame of fire, Revelation 114, seeing all things, discerning all things, piercing at one view from the beginning unto the end of all. And he declares that he will so deal with them, that all the churches shall know that he searches the reins and hearts of men, chapter 2, verse 23. And what work doth he make amongst those secure churches? One is charged with loss of love and faith, another of works, a third with lukewarmness and carnal pride, a fourth with spiritual death as to the generality of them, and most of them with various decays and miscarriages, and those such as themselves took no notice of. But his eye which stays not upon the outside of things, be they never so gay or glorious, but pierces to the secret embryos and first conceptions of sin and declensions, found them out and passed judgment on them in righteousness and equity. Now one great reason hereof is taken from the subtlety of the principal causes of backsliding, and of the means or false reasonings whereby it is brought about. That which is wrought subtly and deceitfully is wrought closely, and is therefore secret and hidden. And the first impressions that these subtle and deceitful causes make upon the minds of professors, the first entanglements which these deceitful reasonings cast upon their affections, if they are not merely transient, but abide upon their souls, there is in them an entrance begun into a defection from the gospel. And for these causes of declensions, they are everywhere expressed in the scripture, and everywhere expressly declared to be subtle and deceitful as number one, and dwelling sin is fixed on as the next cause of declensions and backslidings. This the apostle in this epistle charges under the names of a root of bitterness, or the sin that doth so easily beset us, an evil heart of unbelief and the like with the guilt of this evil. And he himself declares his principle to be deceitful, subtle, that is, close, secret, hidden in its operation and tendency. Hebrew 3.13 to this purpose is seducing, enticing, and craft assigned to it in the scripture. And it has, among others, innumerable this advantage also, that being within us, dwelling in us, having possessed itself of the principles of our natures, it can insinuate all its corrupt and perverse reasonings under the specious pretense of all natural self-love which is allowable. This our apostle was aware of, and therefore tells us, that when he was called to preach the gospel, he conferred not with flesh and blood, Galatians 1, verse 16. By flesh and blood no more is intended, but human nature is weak and frail. But in and by them the deceitfulness of sin is so ready to impose upon us its own corrupt reasonings, that the apostle, though not meet to entertain a parley with the very principles of his own nature about self-preservation, but this deceitfulness of sin I have handled at large in another treatise, here only I observe that the effects of this deceitful principle are, at least in their beginnings and first entrances, very close and secret, open only to the eye of Christ. Number two, Satan also has a principal hand in effecting or bringing about the declension of men from and in their profession. It is his main work, business, and employment in the world. This is the end of all his temptations and serpentine insinuation into the minds of professors. Whatever be the particular instance in which he deals with them, his general design is to draw them off from their first faith, 
from their first love, their first works, and to loosen their hearts from Christ and the gospel. And I suppose it is not questioned, but that he carries on his work subtly, secretly, craftily. He has not called the old serpent for nothing. It is a composition of craft and malice that has laid him under that denomination. His methods, his depths, his deceits are we cautioned against. Hereabout treats our apostle with the Corinthians, 2nd Epistle, 11.3. I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguile leave, through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. It is true, Eve was so beguiled, but who should now beguile the Corinthians, even the same old deceiver, as he informs him, verse 14. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, namely in his fair and plausible pretenses for the accomplishment of his wicked and abominable ends. He works in this manner by deceit, beguiling the souls of men, and therefore doth his work secretly, closely, for in vain is the net spread before the eyes of any fowl, but his work also lies under the eye of Christ. And number three, the world also has its share in this design, the cares of it, and the deceitfulness of riches further this pernicious work on the minds and ways of professors. Matthew thirteen twenty two. By them is the seed of the gospel choked when they pretend only to grow up with it, and that there is a fair consistency between them and profession. Now, though backsliding from Christ and the gospel be thus distinctly assigned to these causes, and severally to one in one place, to another in another, and that is they are especially or eminently predominant in the singular instances mentioned, and so the effect is denominated from them, this is from indwelling sin, this from Satan, and that from the world, yet indeed there is no apostasy or declension in the minds of any which is not influenced by them all. And they are mutually assistant to each other in their work. Now where there is a contribution of subtlety and craft from several principles, all deeply depraved with that vicious habit, the work itself must needs be close and hidden, which craft and deceit do principally aim at, as that poison must needs be pernicious, which is compounded of many poisonous ingredients, all inciting the venom of one another. But the Lord Christ looks through all this hidden and deceitful work, which no eye of man can pierce in two. Again, the conjunct reasonings of these deceitful principles in which they prevail with professors to backsliding are plausible, and by this the malignity of them and their secret influencing of their minds hardly discernible. Many of them may be referred to these heads in which they do consist, extenuations of duties and sins, aggravations of difficulties and troubles, suggestions of false rules of profession, Profession is our avowed observation of all evangelical duties on the account of the authority of Christ commanding them and the abstinence from conformity to the world and all evil on the same forbidding it. The aforementioned principles labor by all ways to extenuate these duties as to their necessity and importance. Granted it shall be that they are duties that may be, but not of that consideration, but that they may be omitted or neglected. Consider the servants in that which is comprehensive of them all. Number one. This is constancy in profession in a time of danger and persecution. The hearts of men are often seduced with vain thoughts of holding their faith and love to Christ, which they hope will save them eternally, while they omit that profession of them which would endanger them temporarily. A duty that also shall be allowed to be, but not of that necessity or importance, is not to be omitted totally, or at least partially and gradually, to save our present concerns, especially while the substance of faith and love to Christ is in our hearts entirely preserved. This ruined many of the rich and great among the Jews, John 12:42. Among the chief rulers many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. They went a great way in believing. And considering their places and conditions, who would have required more of them? Would you have men merely on account of outward profession hazard the loss of their places, interests, reputation, and all that is dear to them? I know not well what men think in this case. The censor of the Holy Ghost in this manner concerning them is, they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Verse 43. Than which nothing almost can be spoken with more severity. And these Hebrews were influenced into declensions from the same fallacy of sin. They were fallen into days in which profession was perilous, and therefore, although they would not renounce the faith, 
whereby they hoped to be saved, yet they would let go of their profession, for which they feared they should be troubled. So our apostle intimates, Hebrews 10, verse 25, And this in the like instances did the subtle reasonings of sin and Satan secretly corrupt the minds of men, until they are insensibly and sometimes irrecoverably engaged in the course of withdrawing from Christ and the gospel. The same may be observed as to other duties, and especially as to degrees of constancy and fervency in the performance of them. From these the minds of men are often driven and diverted by the crafty reasonings of sin, in which they are entered into apostasy. Some of the churches in the Revelation are charged not absolutely with the loss of their love, but of their first love, that is, the especial degrees of it in fervency and fruitfulness which they had attained. Again, by these reasonings, the deceitful principles mentioned to endeavor to an extenuation of the guilt of such evils is lying a tendency to alienate the heart from Christ and the gospel. An instance of it we have in the Galatians. The observation of Judaical ceremonies was by false teachers pressed upon them. They did not once attempt to draw them from Christ and the gospel, nor would they have endured the proposal of any such thing. Only they desired that, together with the profession of the gospel and the grace of Christ, they would also take upon them the observation of the mosaical rites and institutions. Herein, too, they propose unto them a double motive, first, that they should hereby have union with the professing Jews, and so all differences be removed. Secondly, that they should escape persecution, which was then upon the matter alone stirred up by the envious Jews. Galatians 6.12 if both these ends may be obtained, and yet faith in Christ and the gospel be retained, what inconveniences or harm would it be if they should engage into these observances? Accordingly, many did so, and took upon them the yoke of Judaical rites. And what was the end of this matter? Our apostle lets them know that what they thought not of was befallen them, and yet was the genuine effect of what they did. They had forsaken Christ, fallen from grace, and beginning in the spirit, were ending in the flesh. For under the specious pretenses before mentioned, they had done that which is inconsistent with the faith of the gospel. Yea, but they thought not in the least of any declension from Christ. The manner is not what they thought, but what they did. This they did, and this was the effect of it. The corrupt reasonings of their minds, to see by the pleas and pretenses mentioned, had prevailed with them to look on these things as, if not their duties, yet of no ill consequence or importance. So were they deluded by extenuations of the evil proposed to them, until they justly fell under the censor before mentioned. And the principal mischief in this matter is, that when men are beguiled by false reasonings into unwarrantable practices, their corruptions are variously excited to adhere to and defend what they have been overtaken with, which confirms them in their apostasies. Number three, aggravations of difficulties in the way of profession are made use of to introduce a declension from it. For when thoughts and apprehensions of them are admitted, they insensibly weaken and dishearten men and render them languid and cold in their duties, which tends to backsliding. The effect of such discouragements our apostle expresses, Hebrews 12, 12 and 13. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. Having laid down the afflictions and persecutions which they were to meet with, and also declared the end and use of them in the grace and wisdom of God, he shows how ready men are to despond and grow heartless under them, which deprives them of all life and spirit in their profession which he warns them to avoid, lest all end in apostasy. For if men begin once to think hard and strange of the trials that may befall them on account of their religion, and cannot find that in it which will outweigh their sufferings, they will not long retain it. Nor is it advisable for any man to entertain a profession that will not keep and maintain him in a dear year, but leave him to sink under those troubles which may befall him on the account thereof is everything whose real good does not outbalance the evil that for it and upon its single account we must undergo is certainly ineligible. Herein, then, lies no small part of the deceitful actings of the subtle principles mentioned. They are ready to fill the mind with dismal apprehensions of the difficulties, dangers, troubles, reproaches, and persecutions that men may undergo on account of profession. And unless they can make the Lord Christ absolutely to be their end portion and measure of all, 
so as to reckon on all other things, not according to their own nature, but according to the respect which they have unto him and their interest in him. It is impossible, but these things will secretly influence them into declensions from their profession. In the meantime, aggravating thoughts of trouble please men's minds. It seems reasonable to them, yea, their duty to be terrifying themselves with the apprehensions of the evils that may befall them. And when they come indeed, if liberty, if goods, if life itself be required in the confirmation of our testimony to the gospel, there needs no more to seduce us into a relinquishment of its profession, but only prevailing with us to value these things out of their place, and more than they deserve in which the evils and the loss of them will be thought intolerable. And it is marvelous to think how the minds of men are insensibly and variously affected with these considerations, to the weakening, if not the ruin, of that zeal for God, that delight in his ways, that rejoice in tribulation, which are required to the maintaining of a just and due profession, and against the effect of such impressions we are frequently warned in the scripture. Number four. Again, these corrupt and fallacious reasonings do cover and conceal the entrances of apostasy by proposing false rules of walking before God in profession, in which men are apt to satisfy and deceive themselves. So in particular, they make great use of the examples of other men, of other professors, which on very many accounts is apt to deceive them and draw them into a snare. But this head of the deceit of sin I have spoken to at large in another discourse, a treatise on indwelling sin, which I have also narrated in full for the Puritan and Reformed audiobook podcast. Number two. The beginnings of declensions from Christ and the gospel are deep and hidden because oft times they are carried on by very secret and imperceptible degrees. Some men are plunged into apostasy by some notorious crimes and wickednesses, or by the power of some great temptations. In these it is easy to discover that the beginning of their fall, as it was with Judas, when the devil entered into him and prevailed with him for money to betray his master, and many such there are in the world who for money or the things that end in money part with their professed interest in Christ and the gospel. And if they get more than Judas did, it is because they meet with better chapmen in the world than were the priests and the Pharisees. To follow such men from their profession is like the dying of a man by a fever. The first incursion of the disease with its whole progress is manifest. It is with others in their spiritual sickness and decays, as with those who are in a hectical distemper, which at first is hardly known, and in its progress hardly cured. Some negligences and omissions are admitted, and the soul is habituated unto them. And so a progress is made to greater evils, of which also, as I remember, I have treated elsewhere. Number three. Revolters and backsliders do their utmost endeavor to hide the beginnings of their falls from themselves and others. This makes the discovery and opening of them to be difficult. By the false and corrupt reasonings before mentioned, they labor to blind their own eyes and hide their own evils from themselves. For in this case, men are not deceived unless they contribute to their own beguiling. Their own hearts seduce them before they feed on ashes." And herewith they willingly attend to the delusions of Satan and the world, which they do and not watch and against them as they ought. So are they deceived themselves, and when they have made such a progress in their declensions, as that which they begin themselves, it may be, to be sensible of it, then do they endeavor by all means to hide them from others, by which means at length they hide them from themselves, and rest satisfied in what they have pleaded and pretended, as if it were really so." They will use pleas, excuses, and pretenses until they believe them. Was it not so with the church of Sardis? Even when she was almost dead, yet she had outwardly so demeaned herself as to have a name to live, that is a great reputation to be in a good thriving state and condition. And Laodicea, in the height of her apostasy, yet persuaded herself that she was rich and increased and wanted nothing, and knew not, as this expressly testified, that she was poor and fallen under the power of manifold decays. From these and the like causes, it is that the beginnings of men's backsliding from the gospel are so secret and hidden as that they are open only to the all-seeing eye of Jesus Christ, which our apostle here minds these Hebrews of, to beget in them a watchful jealousy over themselves. A reading from John Owen's exposition of the Epistle to the Hebrews on Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. 
Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan Hard Drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.